Bonjour, good morning. Je m'appelle Jean-Marc Mangin, je suis le directeur général de la Fédération des sciences humaines et je suis ravi de vous voir en, grand, en si grand nombre ce matin. There's a long lineup of people are trying to join us, but uh, our promise to you that we, we end these events on time, so we must start and uh, our colleagues will join us in the next few minutes, hopefully. The uh, Federation is a national voice for Canada's 90,000 researchers in the humanities and social sciences. Our membership comprises over 160 universities and scholarly associations across Canada. Our Big Thinking on the Hill series bring research to parliamentarian to inform public policy. Et je souhaite uh, vivement remercier M. Greg Fergus qui va se joindre à nous, notre député parrain de la série. C'est grâce à M. Fergus que ces événements puissent se, se produire dans ce magnifique restaurant du Parlement. We also want to thank the Social Science and Humanities Research Council for the continued support of our series. Si vous avez besoin de traductions simultanées, parce que la présentation sera en anglais ce matin, les détails se trouvent sur votre table, et si vous avez besoin des écouteurs, vous pouvez les trouver à la table d'inscription à l'entrée. Uh, we are here today, of course, to discuss the easiest of topics, the evolving Middle East and the implications for Canada. And we are privileged to be joined by someone who is eminently qualified to help us explore these questions. So let me introduce Janice Stein with a personal anecdote. In the mid-1980s, I was a young student, yes, once. And, and uh, shortly after, uh, Janice had joined UFT from, from McGill. And uh, already, in that age, before Facebook, before emails, there was a real buzz among the students. If you're interested in international relations, in peace, in war, in the Middle East, you wanted to study and work with Janice. It was true then, it's still true today. Professor Stein is the titulaire de la chaire Pelsberg en gestion des conflits au département de sciences politiques de l'Université de Toronto. Il a été directrice fondatrice de l'école Manque des Affaires Internationales de l'Université. Parmi ses nombreuses, nombreuses récompenses, Elle est membre de l'Ordre du Canada, de la Société royale du Canada, et membre honoraire de l'American Academy of Arts and Sciences. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Janet Stein. Thank you uh, very, very much, Robert. I will only correct uh, what Robert said in one way. He was a very senior student and I was a very young professor. That's how this whole story uh, is possible. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here with you. Robert told me that uh, your second, one of the sessions this winter was about the right to die. And I said, that's an easy topic compared with the Middle East. So, which is true, by the way. <laughs> so let me take um, some big steps back here. Uh, because this is the most turbulent period in the history of the modern Middle East that we are now living through, and really make just four big points about where we are going in this part of the world, and then spend just a few minutes talking about Canada's role um, in this region. The first point I've already made that we are seeing the collapse of a hundred-year-old political order. And I think that's a, uh, a fundamental point de base uh, to understand uh, when we look at the world. It's ironic that we are in April 2016. It was in April 1916 that the Sykes-Picot Agreement was signed. Two diplomats, one British, one French, uh, and that was, of course, the foundation for what we can only describe as a colonial order, an order that was put in place by the British and the French uh, through the mandate procedures, and they shaped the Middle East that we know today. 
So for those who might be tempted to mourn the passing of an order, let's just understand which order we're mourning. Uh, these borders were created by two gentlemen who knew not a great deal, let me put it that, charitably, who knew not a great deal about the Middle East, about its languages, its tribes, uh, because a large part of the Middle East is organized around kinship and tribes, about its histories, about its conflicts, uh, and drew borders really for their own convenience. And it is these borders which are now at stake. It is not an accident, by the way, I think many of you saw this on the video, that when the Islamic State stormed back out of Syria across the border in Iraq, there are videographers, and they have great videographers and a really sophisticated digital production team, uh, that they stopped and took a photo of the small little monument that said Sykes-Pico uh, at the border between Iraq and Syria. So they were sending a very, very strong message about which order was ending. So part of the reason, what's the, this is my second point, what's the reason that this 100-year-old order is collapsing? And this, this talk is sponsored by the Federation uh, with the assistance of Shirk. So we know that there is never a single reason for anything uh, in our world. But at the biggest level, uh, part of what the British and the French created in this part of the world were states, and the two strongest examples here, and it's no coincidence, were Syria and Iraq. These were states where minorities ruled majorities permanently. So the Sunni population in Iraq is 20%, that's all. Uh, and yet it has ruled Iraq since its modern creation. In Syria, the Alawite community is 13% of the total population. And it's ruled modern Syria in the post-war period. Now, I can give you some very colorful anecdotes, but when you are a minority permanently worrying about a majority, you create intelligence agencies, you create overlapping intelligence agencies, you, per, you perfect the instruments of terror, and you take autocracy to new levels, frankly. And that's been the story of states in the Middle East that are minority ruled. It's no surprise that as soon as there was one crack in the foundation, the structure collapses. Because these structures in the 21st century are fundamentally not sustainable. And I think there's a big message here in what I'm saying. I know some of you will push me on this. Um, but what you have is a deep, deep failure of governance. And it's not a failure of governance, and I want to make myself clear here. It's not a failure of governance in the way that the development community uh, in this country and in other countries use the concept, uh, because that suggests that if we just clean up the process and we get brighter practices in place and we have more transparency and we have more accountability and all those words that we are all so familiar with, we can really uh, dramatically improve. That's not the core of the problem here. The core of the problem was that we had authoritarian states uh, that ruled by fear and invested in governance structures designed to make sure that the majority did not challenge the minority. So when we think about the future of this region, as I do, um, we need to think um, in very informed and strategic ways about what has to evolve in this part of the world. The th and let me just say, by the way, and I know we only have 20 minutes, and you'd be the timekeeper, okay, Robert? Um, that we've just done some very interesting work um, where we've been able to do, through a variety of innovative digital means, uh, surveys of women and men across the whole region in the Middle East about their attachment to religious law. Uh, and that's going to come to my third point, that there is 
deep attachment uh, to religion. There always has been, but it has deepened in the last 20 years. And it's deepened because not only have states failed, but Arab nationalism, which was the great hope, really, um, coming out of World War II, the 50s, and the early 60s, that failed as well, and failed to deliver on the social and economic and political promises uh, that it had made. So if you think about this, if your state structure frankly delivers not much else but fear, um, delivers on the education side in some cases, delivers for women in some cases, Iraq did that, but by and large rules through fear. And if the Arab nationalists promise, the promise of a unified Arab nation across all the borders um, does not deliver, it's very little surprise that people turn to religion for meaning and significant and content. And so the attachment to religion runs very deep. There are important differences across the 16 Middle Eastern countries, but there is a, a pattern of deep attachment. Now, what mediated that attachment to religion in the, in the work that we just finished? And the results will be uh, coming out very, very shortly. What mediates this attachment? The answer to one question. Do you trust the state? Okay? If you trusted the state, religious law, the implementation of religious law was less important to you. And there are a few countries in the Middle East where people trust the state. So what this tells us is that we are in the face of a deep structural failure of governance in this part of the world. And that explains the violence, the chaos that we're seeing. The final the final point here is not a new one in the Middle East, and I chose it deliberately because I am sounding a note of caution. I am very deliberately trying to sound a note of caution here. Is the role of the peripheral powers, the non-Arab powers in the region, has grown as the Arab states themselves are less and less able to exercise leadership. So the two that will probably spring to mind most quickly for you, Iran, which is a significant Middle East power, but non-Arab, and Turkey, which is a significant power in the region, but of course is Turkic, and is the heir to the Ottoman Empire that for so long shaped the Middle East before the British and the French. If we talk briefly about Turkey for a minute, um, with the election of President Erdogan in Turkey over a decade ago, there was hope um, that his government would serve as a model for Islamic democracy. And he, in fact, approached the region right after the Arab Spring uh, with that promise. One of, he was one of the first to go to Cairo uh, after the events in Tahrir Square um, and hold out the Turkish experiment as a model. Well, those of you who know Turkey know that Turkey has arrested more journalists uh, in the last several years than almost any other country. Uh, Canadian Journalists for Free Expression, uh, which is our own uh, organization in this country that monitors the fate of journalists, has Turkey as its number one priority now. Uh, and this is a government that has turned... Uh, under President Erdogan to authoritarianism. It is deeply involved in Syria, of course, because that conflict is on its borders. And it is increasingly important when we think in any way about the future of Iraq and Syria. Iran is now uh, the major player uh, for the Shia Muslim community that stretches in an arc uh, across the Middle East, it, too, is deeply involved. And along with Israel, um, we see three non-Arab states that are increasingly engaged uh, in the Arab world as this vacuum of governance becomes deeper and deeper and deeper. Layer on to that the historic Russian and American role in this region, 
And you see, in fact, a pattern of intervention from the outside. And I don't only mean military intervention. I mean interventions across a whole series of fronts in which the interests of the interveners are paramount and it becomes even more difficult uh, for Arab citizens, because they do exist, for Arab citizens to think through uh, what their own future might be. I think it's fair to say that the Middle East is the most troubled part of the world today. With the greatest capacity for violence, uh, it exports violence, as we know, um, which reflects the turmoil uh, that it is living through. And so I turn lastly uh, to look at what role Canada can play uh, at an extraordinarily difficult and challenging time. Let me start by saying that we are a small country. We only, we have limited means when we look at ourselves globally. If we compare ourselves to the Turks, to the Saudis, to the Iranians, to the Russians, and to the Americans, who have long shaped this part of the world, were we to make the Middle East our exclusive foreign policy priority for the next decade, we would be a small player. And therefore, we need to understand uh, what we can do and, what, uh, and recognize the limits of our ambitions, but also be very strategic and very focused in what we do do. Let me say secondly, and this is um, a nonpartisan comment because every government um, in our country uh, and our allies have come to a shared consensus that it is important uh, to push back the Islamic State in the Middle East. And by the way, this is not a consensus that unites only the outsiders. This is a consensus that is widely shared by those governments that still remain in power in the region. Ranging from Jordan, uh, that is deeply threatened by what is going on to its north, to Saudi Arabia, uh, to Egypt. Uh, this is a region-wide consensus. Uh, and I think it's important to say as well that the Islamic State is opposed by 85% of the Arab Muslim community in the region. So this is an example uh, where there is a convergence. Now, how this should be done is, of course, always a matter of discussion. Um, it, it, we are, I think, contrary to what we hear, we are seeing significant success on the ground as the Islamic State has lost more than 40% of the territory uh, that it once controlled. And why does this matter? And let me just make two, take a step back comments here about the Islamic State, and then I'm happy to answer questions about it. But this is a militia of millennial, you know, apocalyptic militants who derive their authority from their, and I, I'm very careful here what I say, from their interpretation of texts, derived from the time of the prophet and from the righteous elders. And it's from that word righteous elders that the word, the word that most of you know, Salafist, comes. These are the times of the righteous elders. And so they derive their authority from texts which are read in a literal way. This is not, in fact, the interpretation of the majority of Muslims uh, in the Arab world, and it is for this reason uh, that there is a shared region-wide consensus that they pose a direct threat, uh, not only to the governments, but to the peoples that they come in contact with. Because they have recreated the, the Khalifa, the Caliph, in this period, and again, is that a surprise when you see the collapse of political authority and the collapse of states and the failure of, of so-called modern governments to deliver promises? It's not. Um, it's not a surprise at all. Uh, but because they have recreated the caliph, controlling territory is crucial. You cannot claim the title of caliph if you do not control territory. 
and therefore depriving the Islamic State of its territorial foothold is an imperative if you're going to push the Islamic State back. We are succeeding. It's slow. But in fact, there is progress. And there is, of course, in the process of doing so, more violence, more destruction, uh, more turbulence, and a refugee community um, that is driven not only by the Islamic State, I think that's important for us to understand, but by the policies of Bashir al-Assad, who has created five times the number of refugees that the Islamic State has created by its utter willingness to use force against its own population in the most brutal way. We are contributing, but what more can we do than what we are doing? So let me make the first suggestion um, that we in Canada now uh, are changing our own society in very interesting ways and have grown uh, increasingly incubating in our own country uh, two really strategic resources which can be very important in this struggle. They're not military. The first resource is a population that is drawn from many of these countries with deep and intimate knowledge, which we are not using to the full. How much time do I have? Two minutes? Seven. So, okay, great, seven minutes. One of my most frustrating moments in this country, and I have had many, <laughs> was taking a taxi in London, Ontario, to give a, a lecture at Western University and getting into a long conversation, as you always do, uh, with a community of cab drivers in this country. And he was Afghani. And it was at a time that Afghanistan was a major priority for our country. And we got into a very detailed discussion about the city he came from and the community he came from. And this was at a time when we had two, um, two officers in the department of the then foreign affairs who could speak Afghan languages, two. And I said to him, wow, you know, with that kind of detailed knowledge and linguistic capacity, have you tried to get a government job <laughs> or to make yourself available? And he said he'd been to every one of our agencies, CEDA, well, the Department of Foreign Affairs, IDRC, our intelligence community. There was no interest, right? Some things change, some things don't. And we have in this country a wealth of expertise with a kind of deep local knowledge that Sykes-Picot did not have, number one. And it's a huge asset. The second thing we have, we have a growing digital community in this country of young people who are smart, sophisticated, and the great success of the Islamic State, twofold. One, the territory that they hold so that they could recreate um, the caliphate. But two, they have the most sophisticated digital production team of almost any movement in the world. We have assets here. We are not using these assets. We are not mobilizing these assets in ways that we could, laced with the knowledge and the resources that we have in this country. That seems to me something that we should think about in a very strategic way. It's not that expensive. It draws on who we are, but it's strategic and it's focused. And it can make a tremendous difference. Secondly, what else can we do? Um, and so let me make one comment that I know, because this is on the record, um, will cause some consternation uh, outside this room. Um, we need to be very careful about how we think about the post-Islamic state world in the Arab Middle East. There, let, me, let me try to take this out of Canada for one second and just say the following. In all the discussions I've had with people in Washington, both in government and out of government, there is a reflexive commitment just recreate Syria, recreate Iraq. It's reflexive. It's almost unthinking. This is the only way we can think about this region. 
But what we've done, by the way, and both governments, uh, the past government and the present government, we've provided significant military assistance, support, and training to the Kurds in northern Syria. The Kurds declared two months ago a federation of Syria Rojava, which is in the northern part of Syria, which is a long-term aspiration of the Kurds. In, in the Arab world, in these parts of the world, there is now a growing discussion about whether Syria is not Humpty Dumpty, whether it may not be possible, impossible rather, to put Syria back together in the way that it existed before. There is a parallel discussion going on in Iraq. We are a federation. We have experience. Um, there are creative solutions which don't look like the past and don't look like the autocratic governments where minorities ruled majorities, where borders are configured differently. I think it's very important for the outside interveners to recognize now that we have come to a time in the modern Middle East where Arabs will have to decide what is put back together and how it is put back together, and that we leave space for that to happen in a genuinely respectful way. Final comment, and I know a bear's glaring at me, so this is it. Again, I look at our strengths in this country. The Zatari refugee camp, to give you one example in Jordan, is in a close ally, Jordan, that we've had long relationships with. Half the kids in that camp are out of school. Were our government to decide to make this a signature project, it is now, frankly, a city with no near prospect of its dissolving. Were we to decide to invest in digital health care delivery, in digital education, were we to draw on some of the wonderful architects we have in this country who are thinking about reconfiguring uh, close quarters in very, very different ways, we could make a significant difference, real, significant, measurable, impactful difference in the lives of half a million displaced people on the ground, but in ways that reflect very much who we are. Thank you, Robert. Thank you, Janice, for this uh, compelling uh, presentation. Uh, we do have time for questions. I'm going to ask you to use the mic in the middle of the room. Vous pouvez vous poser vos questions en anglais ou en français. Janice va vous répondre en anglais. Uh, I do ask you that you introduce yourself, and I ask you to ask a question. Uh, when we are in Parliament, we'll use uh, QP rules, 30 seconds, ask tough questions, but there are questions. No speeches this morning. Thank you. Um, let me start first. With a, uh, what are the dangers of implosion in Saudi Arabia? And if so, is it a strategic blunder to sell them weapons? I heard the first part of that question. What are the dangers of strategic implosion in Saudi Arabia? So Saudi Arabia now... Uh, is under more pressure, the government of Saudi Arabia, than it's ever been for two reasons. One is obvious to anybody who lives in Canada and has friends in Alberta, um, is this, the drop in the price of oil, which, uh, and it's loss, and for Saudi Arabia, it's deeper than that. It's, it's the loss of its role as price maker uh, in the global oil community. Because OPEC no longer plays that role for a whole variety of reasons. It can no longer set the global price of oil. Uh, for those of you who watched, there was really a puzzling meeting between the Saudis and the Russians. You would think if they had called the meeting, there was an outcome uh, that uh, was agreed to before they agreed to call the meeting. Uh, apparently, there was not. The meeting broke up with that agreement. It, probably take now another three months of uh, effort. And so this loss in the, in the capacity to be the global price maker 
in the global oil sector is, is a significant strategic loss uh, for Saudi Arabia. Secondly, and equally important, their foreign reserves are shrinking uh, very quickly. And the Saudi royal family uh, has uh, been extraordinarily generous with its citizens over the years. Uh, the, the social safety net in Saudi Arabia is among the richest in the world. As these foreign reserves begin to diminish, of course, it creates pressure uh, on the Saudi uh, government. And the third area is we've had a change of leadership in Saudi Arabia. Uh, King Salman is very different from his predecessor, and his son, uh, uh, the the uh, deputy crown prince, uh, P Prince Mohammed, is, has been given responsibility for defense, for the economy, for the critical files uh, in the kingdom, and he is inexperienced and um, has led uh, Saudi Arabia into its current war in Yemen. So these, these are not promising, right? What's the other side of the story? Um, and there is another side to this story, which is important for people to understand. And it's, it's actually interesting because we were talking about governance before and forms of governance that we don't recognize. So we all know that in Saudi Arabia, women can't drive, which is true, that the human rights record um, is deplorable. That is true. But the Saudi royal family has 6,000 princes and growing. And what takes place every week is those... I, th I hope my number is exactly right. Now, do you know what it is? It's just too many. That's too many? Well, it's actually interesting what they do with their princes, though, because the, here's the second part of the story, okay? And that's because you can, everybody can have a, multiple wives, right? And we're still dealing with the sons of the original king. So that shows you what happens when there's an unequal ratio of at least four wives to every one husband. You end up with a lot of sons. Um, so these princes fan out throughout the kingdom every week and hold town hall meetings in the deserts, <laughs> uh, in cities, um, and are deeply in touch as a result of that um, with what their citizens think in a way that's very difficult for more sophisticated governments sometimes uh, to tap into the sentiment of their citizens. And there's a resilience to that framework. I've seen it over and over. Over the last 20 years, there have been four times where people predicted the demise of the House of Al-Saud. Uh, Gaddafi did it. The story didn't end the way Gaddafi thought it would end, right? And it's partly this resilience um, of this direct, there's, it's, it's direct unmediated conversation where you go to the prince and you say, uh, I have a problem with my neighbor. And the prince says, leave it with me. I'll fix it. This is deep, deep constituency politics that goes on every single week. And so the system is less brittle inside than it looks to be outside. Um, <clears throat> my name is Ruel Amder, and I write for Canadian Charger. Um, two questions. Uh, one, uh, Canada has decided to play a role with, uh, in, in the um, battle against ISIS by supporting uh, the Peshmerga. Uh, the Peshmerga, among other things, goes into Sunni Arab communities, drives the people out, and destroys the, the village. Uh, this seems to me to be uh, counterproductive. Um, in terms of, of wanting to uh, defeat ISIS. Uh, the second question is with regard to um, Canadians going abroad to uh, take part in terrorism. And this certainly should be a concern, um, but I'm wondering if it is being one-sided. That is, uh, we pay a lot of attention to young people who go to Syria to uh, fight on behalf of ISIS. Um, but um, on the other hand, 
there doesn't seem to be much concern about uh, people who go to the West Bank and uh, uh, terrorize the local Palestinian population by destroying their crops and, and uh, uh, their olive trees and threatening their children who go to school. So I'm wondering if you'd comment on those two. So with respect to your first question, which is the role of the Peshmerga, uh, yes, um, Canadian governments, now two, the Harper government and the Trudeau government, have offered significant uh, assistance. Um, and again, it's interesting, decisions get made for interesting reasons. Um, that was a decision because they were the most effective and motivated fighting force uh, in the region, largely because they're cohesive and they recognize that for the Kurds, this is a unique moment in history. Um, this is again coming out of that post-war colonial period. Uh, the Kurds, as you know, are divided among four countries, Iran, Turkey, uh, Syria, and Iraq. And this probably, in a period where borders are collapsing and states are collapsing, uh, Kurdish leaders recognize that this is a moment in history. They're being careful. But what you describe, in fact, um, is uh, a push forward uh, by Kurdish communities in both Iraq and in Syria uh, into territories which they claim and others dispute that claim. And that is a long-standing story. If you take just the city of Kirkuk in Iraq, right, which has 13% of Iraq's oil reserves, Iraqi Kurds claim it as theirs because half the city is Kurdish. Uh, Sunni Arabs claim it as theirs. As we go through this violent, turbulent period, we are going to see multiple examples, multiple examples of disputed claims of this sort where history is a poor guide to the future. Uh, everybody in the Middle East suffers from too much memory. And what they remember is the period of history uh, when their own were at their height of their powers. And that is very much true in Israel and Palestine as well. Uh, with respect to Canadians uh, traveling abroad, uh, of course this is a concern for our government. It's a concern for our government as it's a concern for every uh, European government as well, because there is uh, a fear that some, and, and let me talk about a side actually that you didn't mention, which is the deep worry that some parents, Canadian parents have, where they approach our government and ask for help, because they are concerned about the what their children are doing, and the, they worry deeply that their children will be drawn in. Uh, they're young. Most of the Canadians who have been engaged in this are in their late teens, early 20s. The preponderance of them are male, although there are young teenage girls as well uh, who have been drawn into this. And what we know about teenagers is that their brain has not yet reached the full size of its development. It's almost like toddlers. Uh, their judgment lags behind their mobility, all right? It's generic. And you pray to whatever God you pray to that you're going to live through this period and your children come out of it intact. Um, so our government, um, on a regular basis, gets requests from Canadian citizens, from Canadian parents, for help with this. Now, of course, that's a concern on our side. It's also a concern that we may have, because, and I really believe that the European experience is very different from ours, will be very different from ours, and largely because of the, uh, our own success uh, genuinely building bridges among communities in this country, as opposed to what you see when you go to France or Belgium, and frankly, even Germany. Um, the future is, is bleak, frankly. Uh, as a result of their historical record. And they have a serious, serious problem. I believe our problem is far less serious. But any government in this country would be negligent if they did not take that problem seriously. And I believe this is on the record that our own intelligence agencies have told us they do not currently have the person power they need 
uh, to do the due diligence that they need to do, uh, given the list uh, that has been constructed both by the agencies and by Canadians who have come forward. This, I think, will be a very important period for us with respect to our own rich, diverse um, Muslim community uh, in Canada with whom, uh, you know, who have been admirable citizens in this country and continue to be admirable citizens in this country. How we approach this issue, whether we can work with parents who are concerned and not betray their concerns, um, there are terrible stories right now in England of parents, Britain, of parents who have come forward, identified their children. Uh, their children um, have been detained indefinitely in some cases, which is, of course, exactly what the parents wanted to avoid. How we do this, how we think deeply um, about, in quotes, counter-radicalization, what that means. There are models of success, again, that enlightened governments have used, particularly in the Nordic countries, where we can learn. And where countries have succeeded here, by the way, it is where the whole community gets involved. It is not only government, it's the private sector, it's educational institutions, because strip away all our social science, which I would never suggest we do, but young people, who are attracted to the Islamic State, who come back, who are welcomed back into their own community, who are told there is a second chance, who are readmitted to high schools, who are given the opportunity to work, that's where the risk has been reduced to close to zero. We know communities like this. So this is not a whole of government approach that we're gonna need in the future, it's a whole of Canada approach that we're gonna need if we are going to succeed. But I believe we are better positioned because of our own um, history in this country over the last 30 years than almost any country in the world. We should do better. Hi, uh, my name's Amber. Um, I just wanted to get your opinion, or I guess assessment of what's going on in the ground with ISIS in regards to the crimes that they're committing against women and children, and more importantly, the sexual slavery. And do you think that Canada is properly assessing this? And could they set this as a priority and possibly a number one priority? Thank you. So the, the question is uh, about uh, sexual slavery, which, and, and again, uh, I do think our government uh, is well aware of what is going on. The challenge here is going to be documentation. Um, as it is uh, in, in almost any case that we've had over the last 10 years, uh, we have multiple human rights groups around the world that are building the file, building the dossier, interviewing witnesses, interviewing women uh, who uh, escape uh, for one reason or another. Uh, and this, this, I think the, the challenge here, again, is going to be to share the information. Uh, the question becomes, who will be prosecuted? Under what conditions? How will evidence be collected? Um, and this is often a decade-long effort to do this. We've seen this in other cases. And uh, again, um, I know our government is well aware of this. Uh, let me just share one other interesting um, finding from the research that I've been doing. So here's where research, you know, when you do it, you live it, you think it, you try to figure out how it connects to what's going on uh, in the world. As part of the survey we did, we separated out the men, right? Because, you know, when women have problems, uh, Men are the problem and men are the solution at the same time, especially in the Arab world at this stage uh, in development, as well as women themselves. So we interviewed fathers of daughters uh, in the same survey about attachment to religious law. And we sat, uh, not, we, we segregated out a sample of men who just had daughters, not sons. And we said to them, you know, how attached are you to religious law uh, with respect to uh, multiple wives with respect to dowries. Oh, wow. When you had daughters, you know, that part of religious law we can let go. 
All the rest, no, 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 we're very committed. But that, no, 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 we don't want multiple. I don't want my daughter to be one of four wives. So that part, we can let go. Um, There is, there is, I hope, um, you know, among younger people, um, especially among young women in the Arab world, uh, a recognition of how, what a tough road ahead this is, and that a rights-based agenda and a commitment to Islam go together. They are not antithetical one to the other. Hi, good morning. Thank you for being here. I'm Julie Zarowitz. I'm the Member of Parliament for Davenport. Um, I have two questions. When the Arab uh, Spring was unfolding, so Tunisia, Egypt, and then we go into uh, Syria, remember very distinctly you on CBC saying, it's just a matter of time that Bashar al-Assad, the regime, is going to fall. It hasn't. Right. And so I'd love to know, uh, what is it that you know now that you didn't know then? That's question one. The second is... Let me answer that one first. Okay. Uh, You know, that's the trouble with putting yourself on the line all the time. You're often wrong, right? Um, It is very... But it's a very, very important question. And... Um, it illustrates the point I was making earlier about minority governments ruling majorities. Let's go back to Egypt, right? Uh, and why Mubarak was overthrown. Mubarak is a military officer, um, you know, closely linked to the Egyptian military, to the SCAF, the Supreme Commander of, of, of Forces. Deep roots, deep connections. So if you're sitting back and you're saying to yourself, Will the military intervene against Mubarak? Um, your answer would have been no. They wouldn't have, because he's one of them, right? But the Egyptian military is a majoritarian military that identifies its state itself not with one particular ruler, but with Egypt, which has endured for 5,000 years. And if you talk to any Egyptian that I know and love, will endure for another 5,000 years, longer than anybody else. And that, by the way, I think it's true about Egypt. And so when push came to shove, the military made clear to Mubarak they would not fire on the Egyptian population because that was like firing on themselves. Look at the difference in the al-Assad story. Remorseless, not a compunction about firing on its own population. Alawite, officer at army, mainly Alawite army, 13% of the population was not reluctant to fire on a population that was majority Sunni. That's the piece I got wrong. Mm-hmm. Thank you. And then my second question, say the world unfolds as, as you say it should, where you have the Arab leaders helping to uh, determine uh, how the Middle East will unfold going forward healthily. Uh, in a world that has been ruled by fear, autocracy, um, and in many ways very uncomfortable because they've been in states that really wasn't in their comfort zone. How is it that you build or start building healthy institutions that will help sustain a healthy society moving forward? And who's done that successfully? So that's, you know, the biggest question that we social scientists struggle with. Uh, Got a wonderful project running in this country for 15 years called Successful Societies, what makes societies successful, uh, we don't know the answer to that. And what I can say, and I know this is not encouraging to all of you in the room, it's a work of generations. It's a work of generations. You know, I come from the province of Ontario, um, which I dearly love. <laughs> and for the last two months, what have we been engaged in in the province of Ontario? We have been having a discussion about campaign financing, right? Right. That's a conversation about building healthy, transparent, open institutions, and we've been at this for hundreds of years. We're talking about a region in the two states that I mentioned particularly, but not only, Syria and Iraq, that have had, to be blunt, pathological institutions. Um, So when we think forward, we are talking 30, 40, 50 years, generational It will be a work of two generations until we know what, they know what they tore down. They know what they tore down in Syria. They don't know what they want for the future. And you can't determine what you want for the future when you're being barrel bombed uh, from the sky. 
which is still going on right now. So those of us who are motivated to help people find their voices can do our best, um, as I said, to provide the basic needs, health, education, literacy for a whole generation. And I worry deeply about a whole generation of Syrians, young boys that are out of school. Um, that is seeding uh, violence for the next 15 to 20 years, frankly. You know, people ask me what, all the time, what is the gravest threat to international security? And they want me to say drones or autonomously robotic intercontinental missiles. All these things are a possibility. But here's the answer I always give. Young, angry men out of school. Young, angry women out of school get together. Young, angry men out of school find guns and explode. And we are, this is what we are incubating right now, and that's why I put this enormous effort, emphasis here on education, on bringing young boys back into the educational system. And it's not impossible to do for the Syrians who are outside the country. One last question. Okay, just for a last, very short, tiny question. Uh, two countries you haven't mentioned anything about and say whatever you'd like about are Palestine and Israel. Um, just been there in both, uh, in Ramallah and in Jerusalem, and going back um, again in May. Um, so these, I think uh, these, this is a very difficult time um, in both these countries. Uh, we have governments, um, you know, I'm trying to stay away from <laughs> overtly political statements, so let me try to put it this way. We have governments in both Jerusalem and in Ramallah that are exhausting their writ from their po respective populations. Uh, when you spend time, you know, the proverbial taxi drivers, these are the best, the best source of information. So when you spend time with taxi drivers in Israel, you very quickly get to a conversation of anybody but Netanyahu. And when you spend time in Ramallah, there is despair uh, about uh, a sclerotic government, uh, about a return to what one of my close friends uh, recently called the late Arafat years. So this is not uh, a time when there is the uh, courageous leadership uh, that will be required to move formal agendas forward. Does that mean we do nothing? No. <laughs> there are very exciting things happening um, in both societies. Uh, you know, we uh, at the University of Toronto are just now in a project um, to partner in the development of a new uh, cancer hospital uh, led by Palestinian physicians who are, again, looking for our expertise in this country uh, in the delivery of digital health. And what does it mean to provide continuing education to a physician community like that? Uh, we have strong partnerships uh, on both sides at the university. And again, our focus is really on the digital communities uh, who sit in their own cities but are connected out um, to the broader world in very interesting, uh, innovative, uh, and forward-looking ways. And I think that here, uh, especially in this area, and given our own talented young people who are breaking out and building and doing phenomenal things, one of my students is sitting uh, they are who worked with me on our project on the digital public square, and I'm really proud of Penny. Uh, we have a phenomenal group of young people in this country now, better than any of you because they're innovative, they're risk takers, they're excited, they can do. They like government, but they're not looking to government um, in the same way as earlier generations did. I, I think there are really interesting opportunities uh, but not necessarily uh, with governments uh, in either Israel or Palestine right now. 
Thank you, Janice, and thank you for ending on a note of hope in a gloomy and dangerous part of the world. Um, thank you again for this conversation and for all your, your, all your questions. And again, I'd like to thank Janice for providing us with valuable insight in such a challenging topic. I'd like to present to you, thank you, yes.